Hello, everyone, and welcome to the London Stock Exchange Dead Capital Markets Deep Dive Series. This is our second session, which is a quarterly examination of key fixed income issues that have impacted the market. I'm delighted to be joined today by an expert in fixed income investment, David Katimbo Mugwanya, who is a senior fund manager at Edentry. Good morning, David. Hi. Morning, Odd. Very nice Thank to have you, you on today. <laughs> so, David, you and I um, today, we are going to essentially take a look at the global macroeconomy from the perspective of the US market and see, look at how the difference between the US economic landscape and the European economic landscape can create opportunities for um, issuers, but also for investors like yourself. So we've been following um, the development from central banks um, in the last few months as they move interest rate as a way to tackle inflation. And we've seen that the Fed in, in increased their interest rate earlier in June. Um, we've obviously heard the news last week that the ECB also increased their raise by 50 basis points. So while there seems to be a consensus in rising interest rate, there is, however, a different approach between what we see in Europe and what we see here in the US, with the Federal Reserves um, being a bit more hawkish um, than the ECB. So my question to you is, why are we seeing such a different approach in tackling inflation? In other words, how can we explain that gap between interest rate between the US and Europe? It's a good observation, Odd. Um, you know, central banks globally are moving at um, different um, pace in tightening. They're both um, moving the same direction, i.e. the ECB and the Fed. But um, understandably, the ECB is also looking at growth and is more sensitive to growth. Um, there is a war um, taking place right on its full step between um, Ukraine and Russia, which has growth implications as well, um, not only on energy supply, but also on economic growth and more so production. And so the ECB has to keep one eye on the growth consequences of that geopolitical situation, as well as wanting to tackle um, inflation. It does want to raise rates, and indeed that 50 basis point rate that you mentioned is evidence of doing so. But you could say the terminal rate is going to be lower because of its concerns around the growth um, side of the equation, whilst the Fed doesn't necessarily have that, that particular challenge. And so it's, it's um, concerns are more domestic tackling inflation um, there. And so as you see, um, you know, a central bank leaning more towards um, growth, i.e. the ECB, you could have a wider disparity in those interest rates going forward, especially now that um, rates rises are coming through at a faster clip, you could say, in the US compared to um, Europe. I think the US is widely expected to raise rates by 75 basis points, whereas Europe um, has done 50 thus far and is likely to move at that kind of clip, if not um, lower than that. And so broadly, I'd say um, it's that sort of um, interest rate hike um, differential, and that's likely to stay. Okay. So, you know, if, if I'm, it, I'm understanding correctly, then your, your perspective, you know, looking sort of shorter to medium term is that that gap will actually widen between what we see in Europe and what we see in the US. There's every chance, yes, that that sort of stays like that. I mean, who knows where inflation will peak? Very likely it could even head to double um, digit levels. Now, if you have a bank that is less concerned about growth or indeed wishes to sacrifice growth, it can be much more aggressive in terms of rate hikes and also end up at a much higher um, terminal rate level, that bank being the Fed, whereas the ECB um, wouldn't necessarily have um, such a, a luxury, if you like. And if there's a further point to be added here, is that the ECB is setting policy for um, a number of member states rather than a single um, economy. And that in its own uh, poses some challenges and you could say um, might limit the aggression with which it can raise um, rates as well. But short term to medium term, it's very likely you're going to see um, the states continue at that faster clip and therefore widening differential. So looking at like market activity over the last few months, obviously there's been you know a lot of, lot of, sort of challenge um, on the market. Market conditions have been you know very volatile 
However, we continue to see an increase of U.S. corporates choosing to issue in a European market rather than a domestic U.S. market. This is commonly referred as reverse Yankees, and presumably this is to take advantage of this rate differential. So, for example, we've seen that in May we had two investment grade uh, credit that came to market. We had McDonald's, which issued a euro and a sterling um, denominated bonds. Visa also issued a um, euro denominated bonds. And then more recently in July, we saw that Pepsi tapped the European market with a sterling um, benchmark bonds. So from your perspective as an investor who um, invest predominantly in euro and sterling denominated bonds, you know, what tends to be um, the rational order strategy followed by U.S. Um, corporates to tap into the European market? Is it to take advantage of interest rate differential? Is it to diversify investor base? What's your experience um, in, in, as an investor buying these bonds? I think having spoken to corporate treasurers bringing these bonds to the market, um, it's a combination of both those things, Odd. Um, in terms of the funding costs that they're able to achieve, in Europe, when it's been at negative interest rates for some time, there's a clear uh, benefit, i.e. from a funding point of view, even after hedging of issuing in, in euros, especially when you're funding projects um, locally, hedging your, your currency risk like that. But there's also diversification benefits, um, even though they have a big domestic market, they still want to tap into other pools and broaden the set of investors that they're accessing, broadening the pools of capital that they're accessing, whether that's via sterling, or whether that's via um, euro as well. And so both those factors um, featuring quite, quite prominently in that rationale for them coming um, to this market. From our side, I suppose, as investors, we're also very keen to diversify our underlying portfolios. And that not only means on a sector, term structure, credit rating point of view, you're also looking to diversify that geopolitical, sorry, that um, underlying economic risk. And so um, whether it's um, issuing or rather buying companies that are based um, in the US rather than all being um, in euro or sterling, um, that also helps in terms of portfolio diversification. And um, that diversification point, I think, goes um, two ways. But from their um, point of view, i.e. the issuers, um, it's, it's really that diversification that they're after plus the funding cost benefits that, that they realize in issuing um, in euros that, that they obtain. Thank you very much. I think that's that's very clear, um, you know, as to the reasons for corporates to expand their investor base be, beyond their domestic markets um, as a way to maybe diversify fundings, but also additional liquidity. And I, I just wanted to, to, to maybe just talk about liquidity a little bit, because that's obviously a word that matters a lot to any corporate treasurers trying to raise funds on a debt market. So mm. here is sort of my question to you, right? Um, Given the size of the North American market, as an investor, do you think there are liquidity advantages for U.S. issuers to tap into uh, their market outside of their own sizable domestic market? I think there are clear liquidity advantages for U.S. issuers coming to issue in euro, but it doesn't just stop at liquidity. I'd say it also extends to regulatory oversight and the transparency that, that comes with that, the visibility that comes with that. And so for investors such as myself, for instance, who have to invest the bulk of their portfolios in approved securities, one of the requirements for approval there is the listing requirement. And with listing requirement comes, you know, financial disclosure requirements and even climate related um, disclosures of late. And so you really want to make sure that, you know, when you're investing in securities, the bulk of your portfolio have these minimum disclosure requirements. And when you have US issuers coming to um, the European market and listing their securities um, here, you can sort of rest assured that from a reg regulatory point of view, they have um, these disclosures in place. And so that's one way that, you know, the companies themselves can also benefit by increasing um, their profile from a disclosure point of view, um, accessing a wider um, you know, universe of investors. And so not just liquidity, but there's other um, benefits, regulatory being being the other as well. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point that you're making around a regulatory difference, because that's something that we come across quite a lot here. So, 
um, you know, the, the, there's a slight difference between the domestic U.S. market and what we see in Europe when it comes to bond issuances, is that um, in the U.S. in the domestic U.S. market, bonds, corporate bonds, tend to not be listed because it's not an investor requirement. However, if you tap into the European market and even beyond that, you know, the Asian market. Um, there is um, sort of a requirement from fixed income investors to have the bonds listed on a recognized exchange so they can actually buy the asset. And that's, I think that's, to me, that's a major difference between the two markets. Um, and so US corporate issuers wanting to access this wide pool of investors have to go through sort of the motion of you know, listing the security. Um, but you, um, David, you mentioned sustainability, right? Um, and I know that Eden Tree is obviously pioneer in sustainable investing, in investing, having launched one of the first ethical equity funds in the UK back in March 1988. <laughs> so a, a while back, obviously. Um, <laughs> so as you know, the London Stock Exchange operates um, our sustainability bond market, which essentially is a market that enables all issuers from all parts of the world um, to raise sustainable debt financing by targeting fixed income investors with a dedicated ESG mandate. So looking again, looking at the US market, um, you know, what I'm hearing here and what we see quite a lot now is a rising interest from corporate treasurers to really stay ahead of the ESG curve and fund their strategy through um, accessing ESG investors based in Europe. And it's fair to say that when it comes to ESG, whether it's on the sort of taxonomy or investor appetite or even level of sophistication from investors, Europe is a far more advanced market. So as the portfolio manager of an impact fund, do you see the same trends of the development of ESG commitments coming from the US? And, you know, from your perspective, are there more advantages in issuing ESG label debt in Europe than in the US? What, what's your view on that? Yeah, uh, maybe just worth clarifying as well. We've issued other funds um, since, so the bond funds, um, 2008 Sterling Bond Fund and Short Dead Bond Fund 2017. More recently, Global Impact Bond Fund, as you mentioned um, there, that was this year. Um, but just also taking it a step back in terms of the issuance of um, these bonds. I mean, if you look at the sort of index that the Global Impact Bond Fund is benchmarked against and you sort of dissect it by currency exposures, you find that European denominated securities account for about 60% of that index versus 30% from US dollars. So there's a clear, um, you know, period where, um, you know, ESG issuance was ahead, um, especially in the green social um, sustainable space in euros. Um, you know, for investors such as ourselves that are responsible, it gives us an opportunity to interact um, with issuers to make sure that, you know, we're pressing home um, them um, accounting for these material ESG risks as best they can. But also from their side, it allows them to sharpen um, their toolkit insofar as ESG awareness is concerned or along their ESG journey, pushing them further than if they were just um, issuing in the US. Because the audience we believe in, in Europe is much bigger ESG is high on the agenda, as, as you mentioned there. And so these sorts of investors, even mainstream investors, not just um, ESG investors, um, will be much hotter on ESG issues and also encourage best practice. Um, you know, we engage a lot. We um, seek to catalyze best practice amongst our, our sort of entities that we lend to. And um, really, that's the advantage um, that they're getting um, by coming to these, these shores and um, issuing here. Understood. So my final question to you then would be, you know, putting your portfolio manager hat on is what is your investor appetite for this increase um, of U.S. debts coming to the European market? You know, is it something that you would like to see more of to be able to invest? And if yes, would you like to see it expand to, you know, maybe broaden the universe of issuers that we see? Because obviously we see quite a lot of, you know, investment grade name coming out of the U.S., but there, there is also the high yield universe. There is also the municipality um, universe as well. So what what's what would be your appetite for risk in these asset class 
You know, as, as an investor, as a PM, I'd say I'm biased, obviously, towards responsible and impact. Um, and so more ESG labeled issuance certainly is welcome, is always welcome. Um, any portfolio manager would still want to diversify their fund uh, by high yield or by sector. And so that allows for better portfolio diversification. And so, again, more issuance there. Um, is of use. But insofar as um, the ESG journey is concerned and that, that labelled um, issuance point there, um, it's worth stressing, of course, um, at the very beginning, multilaterals led the way corporates then picked up. Um, governments are very well placed to issue because of the size of issuance that they need to, um, you know, that they can um, generate. And in effect, more funding needs to go into that transition towards a sustainable economy, some of which will come via um, bonds such as these. And when you look at governments, you look at local governments, you look at municipalities, a lot of what they do creates social impact, has social impact. And so seeing more issuance from them not only allows for diversification of the portfolio, but also allows investors such as ourselves to generate um, more social impact, if you like, um, by deploying funds into bonds um, such as these. So certainly a long um, wish list, but definitely more issuance more that is impactful and we believe that that opportunity exists with examples such as um, munis but also um, governments and, and other corporates as well. Now that's interesting because actually when you look at um, the issuance, ESG debt issuance coming out of the US, um, you'll find that the actually the largest portion of ESG debt is actually issued by US munis and as you say particularly they're very strong in the social social side where they issue quite a lot of social bonds so it would be certainly good to see that maybe expanded to um, the European market um, but thank you David thank you very much for this um, very insightful chat um, I thought thank you. it was very interesting it's, very nice to see you and hopefully we'll get to see you um, here in New York or um, back in London. So this ends uh, the second deep dive um, session. We hope that you find it very interesting and that um, along with all the work that we do at the London Stock Exchange um, in facilitating the flow of global capital between investors and issuers. You can read up our thought leadership uh, paper that will be published on the LondonStockExchange.com. And in the meantime, we look forward to speaking with you next time.